Tonight, I'm going to the Word of God for just a few moments. It will probably be just a few moments because I'm a little bit tired. But if, if you'll pray, maybe God will rejuvenate me and I will come alive. Some of you wouldn't pray because you want a short sermon. I don't like that. All right. Well, we'll see about that. Revelation chapter 17, verse 14. You're a mighty fine group of people, I have to tell you. A mighty fine group of people. Revelation chapter 17, verse 14. Here we go. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are are with him, are called, and chosen, and faithful. And tonight, I'm talking about the called, the chosen, and the faithful. Sister Stoops, are you holding your hands out to me? Oh, it's Bella. Okay, just curious. I was going to go down and give you a hug if that's what you wanted. <laughs> All right. God bless you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. We're on for a wild ride tonight. Hallelujah. Praise God. The Bible predicts that Jesus is going to return for his chosen. I am so excited, ladies and gentlemen, to announce to you that the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Hey, if you're going through some trials right now, you need to comfort one another with these words. Don't worry, the Lord's coming. This could be the day. This could be the end of our race. This could be the moment that God calls his children home. I, I love the positive scripture that I just read to you. Notice it says, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. The dead in Christ shall rise. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Right. There's nothing dubious about this. There's nothing gray about this. This shall take place. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Guess what? You're not going to get kicked out of heaven because of some mistake you made. Well, you ought to high five somebody for that. That's worth everything right there. Nobody's going to come up and say, everybody out of the pool. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. I want to tell you that immediately after God's chosen are extracted, that Jesus said, then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Now, folks, when Jesus says that, that is a mouthful. Do you realize how many... People have been martyred for the name of Jesus. Do you know how many people have died martyrs for the cause of Jesus Christ? It's an untold number. And yet Jesus said there's a time coming immediately after God takes his people out of this world that there will be tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world. There has never been a time that will be as bad and as grisly as what the world is going to see immediately after Jesus takes his people home. That's right. Every one of us who have answered the call of God, we ought to always remember that we've been saved for something and from something. Amen. Oh, don't feel bad for me. I'm, I'm glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. I, I'm just so thankful to be saved. I'm so thankful to be in, in the number of God's people. I, I, don't, I don't think anybody should feel sorry for God's people. And all these precious people that we started counting. And by the way, th there were some of you that were in the church long before 1982, like my precious mother, who got the Holy Ghost, I believe, in 1938. Thank you. 
But don't feel sorry for these precious people who are faithful to the name of the Lord and faithful to serve God and faithful to go to church and faithful to pray. Because guess what? God is saving us for something and from something. In heaven, immediately after the rapture, there's going to be a time of rejoicing, as you might imagine. How many think that you could rejoice right after the rapture trumpet blows? Da, 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 da. And all of a sudden, you're standing in the assembly of a great number of people. And standing in front of you is His Majesty, the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's your loved ones that have gone on before you and they're standing there with open arms saying, oh, come here, son, and give me a hug. I'm so glad to see you. Oh, I'm so... Hey, do you think there might be some rejoicing going on immediately after the trumpet of God sounds? There will be a time of the marriage supper of the Lamb. And what a time that's going to be when we sit at the table with the Lord Jesus. And we have that marriage supper of the Lamb. And then the Bible talks about the judgment seat of Christ. And I need to talk about this just for a minute. Because we need to understand that the judgment seat of Christ is not the great white throne judgment. You see, the judgment seat of Christ is a judgment of the saved. It's the saved that are in heaven. Right after we get done wiping our mouths with our royal napkins and tossing them into the plate, there's going to be what is easier for us to understand as an awards ceremony. Kind of like the end of the year school banquet, which by the way, if you haven't signed up for, you need to. And people are going to be recognized for the service that they gave to the Lord. I got to looking at that, and I thought I should explain this to you so that you would never feel sorry for the faithful. I want to read to you just two different tiny scriptures about the judgment seat of Christ. First one I will read is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, where Paul writes, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now this is not a judgment of the lost. This is the judgment of the saved. This is where your name's going to be called and you're going to be called forward and you're going to be recognized for the service or lack thereof. That's just what's going to happen. Now let me explain a little bit more and I will jump back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and I'm just going to read a couple of verses so you can know what you're going to be facing at the judgment seat of Christ. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 3.13 Every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. And so there will be this time of awards that will be handed out. Now I have to tell you that if you spend all your time doing earthly stuff, which is considered wood, hay, and stubble, when the Lord lights a fire to that, it's going to burn up and you'll be standing there going, yeah, I thought that was pretty important what I was doing, but I guess it had no eternal value. No. So, you're homeless in heaven. Well, maybe not homeless. You still have a mansion. But it won't be as big and as nice as somebody else. And I'm just telling you the facts. You see, you're saved by the grace of God. You're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. The awards are given, however, based on your service. You might start thinking about what you are doing for the Lord because one of these days you're going to stand before God. Now, I also want to say this to you very quickly that you should not be troubled if 
What you have done for Christ has not been sufficiently recognized. Now, we're all human, including this guy. And we all like to be recognized when we do something that's good, especially if it involves sacrifice. But sometimes, listen to me carefully, it's not the bad pastor's fault. It's not the bad Sunday school superintendent's fault or the bad principal's fault. Ha, huh, you got it twice. <laughs> I only got it once. It's not the bad youth pastor's fault. Sometimes God is purposefully going to allow you to do something that will not be recognized. And he's going to stand back and he's going to watch to see what you're going to do when you're not recognized for it. But I got news for you. Don't worry because there is a huge party planned. And there is not one thing that you've done for the Lord that God is going to forget. I hate to say it, but some folks' job that they do for the Lord, we only notice it when it's not going right. <clears throat> Am I there? There are some jobs that we do that we, we don't really notice it until it's not going quite right, and then we notice it. Brother Roach, are you back there? You, can you hear me? Testing one, two. Yeah, you can hear me, right? I can hear you. <laughs> it's a good thing you can hear me or I'd be talking to you about it. That's the way it is with a sound man's job. When he's doing his job really well, nobody says anything. When something happens, we go, oh, everybody looks at him and goes, what? He goes, I can't tell you how many times you'll look at me and you'll go. <laughs> but there are some times when we do not get the recognition that we really should get or you don't get the recognition that you really should get. And for that, I wish I could do a little bit better. But I also want to tell you that, that no matter what job it is, how big or small, if you're doing it as unto the Lord, if you're saying, I do this job not for the applause of man, but I do this job for the glory of God, I'm going to tell you why. There's going to come a day when your name's going to be called and you're going to go up to the front of the class and, and the Lord's going to say, now, you've been faithful in a few things. Now I'm going to make you ruler over many. And so what you've done for Christ shall be revealed at the judgment seat of Christ. What you've done for Christ shall be plainly and openly known. The judgment seat of Christ will disclose and reveal the character and the worth of the work that you did on earth. If your work survives the judgment seat of Christ, you will receive your reward. But if any person's work is burned up under the test, he will suffer the loss of it, losing his reward, though he himself will be saved. And so we need to realize that there is the judgment seat of Christ for the saved and the great white throne judgment is for those who are going to be lost and the next thing they're going to hear is his name is not written in the Lamb's book of life. Take him, bind him hand and foot, cast him in outer darkness where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. No, my name was not in the book! So that judgment is not one you want to be a part of. The judgment seat of Christ is okay. Just start working for God because working for God and spending time doing things for people, things for the kingdom of God, that is how you will really shine at the judgment seat of Christ. That's what's going on in heaven while the earth there is a completely different situation. Now, while we're having the marriage supper of the Lamb and the judgment seat of Christ, do you know what's going on on earth? The tribulation is going on. Now, I have some friends that intend to be here in the tribulation. I really feel bad for them because I'm not going to be here. I'm taking the first thing out. 
and there's a reason why I can say that. God has not appointed us unto wrath, but to obtain salvation. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. I have several promises in the word of God. As it were in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days when the Son of Man shall be revealed. As it were in the days of Lot, so shall it be in the days when the Son of Man is going to be revealed. What are you talking about? I'm saying that before the fire hit Sodom, angels took Lot out. And the angel even confessed and said, get to that town called Zoar, because I can do nothing until you're safely in that city. And I'm going to tell you something. God is not going to send his judgment upon the earth until the church of Jesus Christ is safely in the city that he has prepared for us. Hallelujah. Now, you know, it's very important tonight that you listen with an open heart. And if you sit there and you kind of debate with me while I'm preaching, well, hasta la vista. Sorry, I couldn't help you. But if you will receive what God is saying, I, I'm going to tell you tonight that God has a great reward for you. That God has a reward like you've never heard of or even thought of. You can't even imagine how great this reward is going to be. But on the earth, there will be seven years of tribulation. And in Revelation 19, it says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And I think you all know that these armies coming with Jesus are the precious people, the faithful of God, that have been called by the Lord, they have been chosen by the Lord, and they have been faithful to the Lord. And here they are on white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. They've got their wedding garments on. And Revelation 17, 14 says, they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. I wish that everybody who started out living for God were still living for God right now. I don't know of anybody that I'm happy that they lost out. I don't know of anybody that I could just say, ha, I'm so glad they lost out. I wouldn't be worth my salt as a pastor if I felt that way. I've never wanted anybody to be lost. I wish everyone who started out living for God would still be in the church today as you are. Those that make it to the marriage supper of the Lamb are called and chosen and faithful. And I want to just talk about the faithful just for a minute. Will you give me just a moment of your attention? Just, that's it. I, I, the people who are going to make it all the way home will be steadfast and dependable. You can count on a faithful man. You can count on a faithful woman. They will hold on. They will endure. They will continue even when it gets tough. A faithful person will not give up no matter how difficult it is. He will hold on. He will fight on. He will carry on. Even when others are quitting, when life is not making any sense, he'll just keep shouldering on, soldiering on, going on because he's faithful. Being a good servant of God is really important, but that's only half of the equation. We must hear him say, well done. So that's a good servant. But the other half of that is, thou good and faithful servant. So half of it is being good. The other half is being faithful. Now look, folks, I can't live for God just on emotion. I love Sunday night. I love to shout and dance. It's one of my favorite services. I love to give God radical praise. But when school's going on in public school or Christian school, or you're at the job site and the guy standing next to you is dropping the F-bomb every other word. 
It's not like Sunday night anymore. But that's where the faithful shine. I know what it's like to, to go to my place at, at the lunch table in the lunchroom and sit down and they've put a Playboy centerfold at my place. And I got up, rolled my lunch bag together, and walked out, and then they cursed me for walking out. I know what it's like for them to get their heads together, and I walk into the lunchroom, and one of them kind of looks at the other one and raises an eyebrow and says, hey, Rick, let me tell you a joke. And they start into this horrible, vulgar joke, and I stand up, and I start rolling my lunch bag together. I won't argue with them. I won't fight with them. I pick up my bag, and I walk out of the lunchroom, and they cursed me because I wouldn't stay and listen to their dirty joke. But when I gave my heart to Jesus several years ago, I didn't say as long as things go my way, I promise I'll serve you. I didn't say as long as everything goes the way I think it should go, I'm going to live for God. As long as nobody offends me, hey, preacher, you can count on me. That's right. You know what I said to God? I said, I'm going to live for you no matter what it costs me. I'm going to serve you no matter what anybody does to me. I'm going to live for you, God, because I know that it's required in a steward that he be found faithful. It's not always about the jump and the shout. It is a lot, however, about being consistent and being faithful whether you feel good. Hey, I, I, I'm going to confess to you. There's sometimes I cannot feel the presence of God like I want to feel him. Maybe some of you just wake up in the morning talking in tongues. Sometimes I wake up with aches and pains. Maybe, maybe there are some people that never have a, a time when they're feeling like, does anybody even know that I'm living for God? But if you're normal... There's going to be times when God's going to seem a million miles away and that's when you get to show God that you are faithful, that you're not going to be inconsistent, that you're not needing God to give you some kind of an emotional fix so that you can live for him. Oh, I love the emotions. Don't get me wrong. I love to feel the presence of God. But when I can't feel anything, I made a decision several years ago that whether it felt good or not, I was going to live for God. When I think of some of the precious people that once lived for God and threw in the towel, I just, well, I, I can't think of it very long because it'll, it'll start bothering me. When I think of people who, because of something happened and they got offended, and that's the way the devil always works. He's always going to try to bring some kind of an offense. And usually, somehow, some way, I don't know how this works. I haven't got this figured out yet. Maybe someone can explain it to me. But it always seems like somehow or other, maybe I'm just being a baby, but it seems like it always ends up being the pastor's fault. And I haven't quite got that, I haven't quite got that figured out yet. But, I, but I've seen that when something goes wrong in somebody's life, it seems like the next thing I know is, uh, they're looking at me and kind of giving me a little scowl, and I'm thinking, huh, oh, I wonder what I did. I ha I'll have to sit down with Sister Carrie. She's going to have to explain this to me because she's a counselor. Maybe I need counsel. Oh, uh, don't, don't you go there, Brother Roach. But there's something about a man or a woman that resolves and says, you know what, I'm hoping for all the best. I, I want everything good and I don't want anything bad. I'm hoping that God will bless me and my family and, and I'm hoping that things will always go really good. But I'm going to tell you something, devil, right now. If everything goes to hell in a handbasket, I'm still going to live for God. Yeah. Somebody 
Somebody has got to have a determination in their heart that says, you know what? I didn't start out living for God because it was popular. I didn't start out living for God because everybody else was doing it. I started out living for God because he died on the cross for my sins. And one day I looked up at that cross and I said, sir, if you'll do that for me and forgive me, I promise you, I'm going to live for you the rest of my life. And so it is. And so I will by the help of God. Faithfulness is huge with God. You can depend on God. Can he depend on you? The world crowns success. God crowns faithfulness. In the book of remembrance, faithfulness and famous are all one word. Faithfulness in little things is a great thing. And I have to tell you, some of you look at me right now, I, I'm, I'm preaching short, honest. What one is in little things, he also is in big things. Right. You show me a man that's faithful in the smallest thing, I'll show you a man that will be faithful in the largest thing. You show me a man that's unfaithful in the littlest thing, I'll show you a man that will be unfaithful in the largest things. Well, who said that? Well, I'll have to give the credit. You know, we have to give credits, right? Jesus said that. It's found in Luke chapter 16, verse 10. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, uh-oh, don't clock out. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous money, who will commit to your trust the true riches? Amen. And if you have not been faithful in that which, another, which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in mammon, which means you cannot serve God in money. Amen. So if you're honest in small matters, you'll be honest in large ones. If you cheat even a little, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. Complete honesty in little things is not a little thing. It's important to understand that lying disqualifies you from being faithful. Look, if the check's not in the mail, you just better zip it. You understand? All liars shall have their part. That's not a joke. We need to be the most honest people in the world. Painfully honest. It is important that we understand that, that being faithful means that we're honest, that we tell the truth. They that are with him, those that are living for him, they're called chosen and faithful. Whatever your talent, Whatever your mission, whatever your service, whatever your duty, whatever you give, I just want to encourage you tonight, be faithful, be consistent, be loyal, be dependable. Right. Somebody immediately asked me, well, how long? Well, that's answered by the Lord too. Revelation 2.10, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. How long are you going to be faithful until God takes me home? Well, how many of you have heard of Steamboat Geyser? Huh? You haven't? Surely you have. Has anybody heard of Steamboat Geyser? You have. You have not. Well, Steamboat Geyser has the distinction of being the tallest geyser in Yellowstone Park. And it's the tallest active geyser in the world. The geyser averages up to 300 feet during an eruption. But Steamboat Geyser is notoriously unpredictable. The geyser had a 50-year dormancy period. The most recorded eruptions of the Steamboat Geyser in a year was in 64 when park officials recorded 29 eruptions. But you know, because it's so inconsistent, nobody talks about Steamboat Geyser. But how many of you have heard about Old Faithful? 
Oh, yeah. We've all heard about Old Faithful. Old Faithful's not the tallest geyser in the park. It averages 130 feet. The highest recorded was 180 feet. But Old Faithful is not famous because of its height. It's famous because it has a regular pattern of erupting. Other geysers can erupt at any time, but Old Faithful typically erupts between every 60 to 110 minutes, and just about everybody has heard of Old Faithful. And I'm telling you, I appreciate, that's why I had you stand, the people who are consistent year after year, day after day. You may not be the brightest candle in the pack. I may not be the brightest light in the pack, but I'll tell you something. There's one thing I want God to look at me and say, that poor boy sure is trying. He's not going to give up. I'll tell you one thing about him. He's consistent. He's still going at it. Do you ever stop and think about this? By persistence, the snail made it to the ark. Huh? Do you think about that? You don't have to be the fastest. You just have to be faithful. You don't have to compete with your brother. He might be the hare and you might be the tortoise, but that's okay. God's not looking for you to compete with somebody else's talents. He just wants you to be faithful with the talents he's given you. Come on, somebody. I can teach a Bible study. I can teach a Sunday school class. I can clean a bathroom. I can clean out the bus. I can go out and invite kids to church. Come on, I'm going to do something. Why? Because I want to be used of God. And one of these days, he's going to call my name at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And I'm going to step forward. And he's going to say, okay, let's read off the stuff that this man has done for the Lord. And I don't want to get the chills and go, oh, God, I was so busy doing all my stuff. I tried to do something for you once in a while. I started this and quit. I started that and quit. I started this, but I didn't finish it. I started that and I didn't finish it. And God says, hmm, you know, this reward goes to the faithful. I'm thankful for every virtue that we read in the Bible. How many is thankful for the virtues of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance? Amen. But you know there's a virtue not listed in Galatians 5 that's found in 1 Corinthians 4. And if you don't have this one single virtue, all the others are wasted. And it just simply says in one sentence, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful what oh this is required this is not optional now brother soups i just want you to know uh there's going to be six sundays this summer that i will be out of church i'll be there for the seventh sunday and then i'll be gone eighth ninth and tenth sunday now if there's anything i can do for the lord you let me know but when fall comes that'll be hunting season and I'm going on a trip, and, and then when I get done with that, uh, and we're going to start into the ice fishing season, and then when we get done with that, we're going to put our boat in the water. Now listen, I'm not against hunting, I'm not against ice fishing, I'm not against fishing, I'm not against playing golf. I'd love to find somebody in this church that wants to play a game of golf. I haven't played golf in a long time. Well, there, that got a wonderful response. <laughs> But I'm not going to be the preacher that calls in sick Sunday morning and goes out to the golf course and shoots this beautiful game of golf. While my counterparts are in the house of God going, Woo! Woo! I love you, Jesus! Hallelujah! For one thing, I wouldn't be able to tell anybody my great score. And that would kill me if I, if I shot a great game and I couldn't tell anybody. I refused to be like the guy that climbed under the bed early Sunday morning and his wife was pleading with him, please, John, you got to come out. It's, it's, it's time getting close to Sunday morning service. He said, I'm not going. Oh, come on, Johnny. You got to go. No, I don't. You tell me one reason I have to go. She said, you're the pastor. <laughs> you got to go. <laughs> I 
There's one thing that God is going to require of me. Now, I, I know this all virtues, that I want all those virtues, but there's one thing that's required of me, and that is that I would be faithful. Be thou faithful unto death. Somebody said, well, you know what? I'm going to let the younger people start caring a little, little bit more. Well, you just go right ahead. I'm going to keep working for God. What are you talking about? I don't read anything about be faithful until you retire. I, I read something in the book that says, be thou faithful unto death. Amen. Well, are you still amen to me? Amen. Hallelujah. I want to be faithful. It's required. Never give up. Steady under fire. Okay, Joseph. Come up and give them hope. You're a 19-year-old kid. You're critically wounded. You're dying in the jungle in the La Drang Valley, 11-14-1965. LX, LZ, X-ray, Vietnam. Your infantry unit is outnumbered eight to one. And the enemy fire is so intense from 100 or 200 yards away that your own infantry commander has ordered the medevac helicopters to stop coming in. You're lying there you're listening to the enemy machine guns and you know you're not getting out this time. Your family is halfway around the world, 12,000 miles, and you'll never see them again. And as the world starts to fade in and out, you know this is the day. Then over the machine gun noise, you faintly hear the sound, the whoop, whoop, whoop of a helicopter, and you look up to see an un armed Huey. But it doesn't seem real because no medivac markings are on it. But Ed Freeman's coming for you. He's not medivac. It's not his job. But he's flying his Huey down into the machine gun fire after the medivacs were ordered not to come. Ed Freeman's coming anyway. And he drops it in. He sits there and the machine gun fires. They load two or three of you on board. Then he flies you up and out through the gunfire to the doctors and nurses. And he keeps coming back. At least 21 times Ed Freeman came back. And he took you and your buddies out. And you know you would never have gotten out. That single helicopter brought water, ammunition, supplies that saved many lives on the ground. And the same pilot flew more than 70 wounded soldiers to safety. At a White House ceremony, July 2001, Ed Freeman was presented with a Medal of Honor by President George W. Bush. Ladies and gentlemen, that's faithful. That's what faithful looks like. Be thou faithful. I want to be more faithful to God than I am to a job. I want to be faithful to my family, but I want to be faithful to God first. You can ask my wife. I have to be pretty sick or contagious to keep me home from church. It's not because I'm a superhero. I just believe that God requires me to be faithful. And I want to make it all the way home. And when he says, 
Rick Stoops, rise, step forward. I really want to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. Ah, oh, son, turn around here and look. I'm going to make you ruler over many. I don't know if you get it or not. But we get one chance to be faithful. We get one chance to be consistent. We get one chance to say, God, I may not be the most talented, but I can be faithful. If somebody comes up and verbally slaps me, which they've done many times, I didn't say, well, I guess I'm not called to preach. I quit. No, sorry, you're stuck. I made a commitment to God that I would be faithful. I'll never forget the family that used to live out in Reedfield. <coughs> Gary and his wife and there was a nor'easter <laughs> and it was home Bible study night <laughs> and crazy me I get in my minivan and I'm driving out to Reedfield and literally the snow is up against the bottom of the car at places I'll never forget the shock on their faces when I rang their doorbell. They thought they got a night off. There are no nights off. And there's many of you that I've sat in your home by the hour and turned the flip chart and taught the Word of God now it's your turn now you get a chance to be faithful these hands are the, not the most gifted hands but I've played a pile of music with these hands and a lot of it's been a little home missions church that only 15 or 20 people heard it. it wasn't in a concert hall but I didn't belong in a concert hall I was just doing what I could do for the Lord because God called me and I wanted to be faithful hats off to all of you who want to be faithful Be thou faithful unto death. And God said, I will give you a crown of life. See, it's so easy to start, but it's so much harder to finish. You have to say, God, look, I'm not as young as I was, and I ache when I get up in the morning now. I'm still pretty young, though. say I'm strong but the old say I'm young <laughs> I've seen people in this church week after week year after year and I thank God for you I cannot list names right now because if I did I'd have to stretch this through another hour but you know you've been faithful and one of these days God's going to look at you and he's going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Would you bow your heads with me, please? 
Maybe there's a young person. Maybe there's an elder. Maybe there's a senior, a single, or a married person that wants to say, God, I want to be faithful. One of these days, I want to hear you say, well done. Oh, the most cherished words I will ever hear is when I stand over there and he says, well done. Listen, folks, it will be worth it all. So, where's the person that wants to be faithful? Oh, Brother Stoops, you don't know what they said. Can't be much worse than what's been told me. You don't know what they did. You don't know what happened to me. And some of you have gone through horrendous things in your walk with God. But God's been faithful to you, hasn't he? You know what? I'm going to tell you, brethren, sisters, I believe you can hold on a little bit longer. I believe you can be faithful a little bit longer, can't you? I believe you can, can't you? I believe you can be faithful to God just a little bit longer. Don't give up. You can do this. You can do it. I feel like I'm walking up and down the line of the soldiers and I'm standing behind you and I'm saying, you can do it, you can do it. Hold on a little bit longer. Help's on the way. Don't give up. Don't throw your rifle down. Don't throw your helmet off. You're a soldier of Jesus Christ. Endure hardness as a good soldier. You can do this. Don't give up. If the whole world turns against you, don't give up. You, it will be worth it all. God will make it up to you when he tells you, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You and I are going to stand over in heaven drinking lemonade and we're going to chuckle about the little troubles that we had. Go ahead and pick up that, that kid for Sunday school. You can do it. Go ahead and offer God a sacrifice that's well-pleasing to the Lord. Be faithful. Just be faithful. I wonder how many would just come forward with me tonight. Thank you for allowing me to preach to you again tonight. I'm just a dying man preaching to people. I want to be faithful. I just want to be faithful. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to be faithful. I know that I can make it. I know that I can stand. No matter what may come my way, my life is in. How many remember when you were a kid singing this? I know that I can make it. I know that I can stand. No matter what may come my way, my life is in His hand. With Jesus I can take it. With Jesus I know I can stand. No matter what may come my way, my life is in Your hand. With Jesus I can take it. With Him I know I can stand. No matter what may come my way, my life is in Your hand. I wonder how many girls and ladies would lift your hands with me right now. And I wonder how many of you would just say, God, no matter what, it's you and me forever. I'll never leave you, God. I'll always stay with you, no matter what. I'm never going to get mad and quit. I'm never going to get hurt and quit. I'm never going to get offended and quit. I'm always going to live for you. Let's pray for all the ladies of the church. God, in the name of Jesus, bless all the ladies of this church and help them, oh God. Help them, oh God, to have a determination never to quit. 
but to make it all the way home for Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name. Now, how many boys and men would lift your hands right now and say, God, by the grace of God, I want to make it all the way home. I'm going to complete my mission. I'm not going to leave an unfinished task. Come on, lift your hands. Now, in the name of Jesus, Father, I commit my life into your hands. Lord, I pledge that I will stay with you. All the days of my life, I will serve the Lord. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So when your tests and trials, they seem to get you down. Here I am. you reach out to somebody beside you where it's appropriate and would you pray that God would help your friend to make it all the way home and that your friend would be faithful come on find somebody reach out to them right now come on reach out to somebody reach out to somebody help my friend help my brother help my sister to be faithful Help my friends, my children, my grandchildren, my sons and my daughters, my church family. Oh God, help all these brothers and sisters to be faithful, to complete their mission for God. No matter what may come my way, my life is in your hands. I know that I can make it I know that I